2016, Pride Action Tank, Pat, began working to center LGBT older adults in aging. Pat started, well, started with Out Aging Summit on our possibilities, helped incubate One Roof Chicago, an organization focused on future mixed income, multi-generational housing development, and workforce development initiatives partnered with Equity Illinois and the passage of Senate Bill 1319, the Equity for LGBTQ Older Adults Act, and collaboration to develop the outreach advocating for safe and inclusive spaces for LGBT older adults, which brings us here today. I wanna to thank the many state elected and appointed officials, including leader Greg Harris, agency staff, service providers and advocates for being with us, with us here this morning. Our goals for this program are to educate participants on both the joys and needs of the LGBT older adults and caregivers, as well as put forth a call to action that ensures that LGBT older adults continue to be uplift, uplifted in policy and programs and services. Two people will be sharing their stories of resilience with us. Then we'll move into our opening panel, then a brief overview of draft le legislation highlighting LGBT older adults, and then our policy making panel followed by question and answers. Next up to get us started is Kim Hunt, Executive Director of the Pride Action Tank. Good morning, Kim. Good morning, Roy, and thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here. I'm Kim Hunt and my pronouns are she, her, hers. Before our storytellers come on, I want to take a moment to acknowledge that Pride Action Tank does nothing alone. Our highly collaborative model presents opportunities to work directly with folks with lived experience, as well as service providers, policymakers, researchers, advocates, and others. The outreach initiative that Roy mentioned is one such example of this collaborative approach. The initiative was the brainchild of our Out Aging Committee that was initially assembled to organize the Out Aging Summit. The committee consists of Antonio King, who's from the Chicago Department of Public Health, Britta Larson from the Center on Addison, Nick Westrait, uh, a UIC scholar, Kelly Rice from Howard Brown Health, Cynthia Tucker from AIDS Foundation Chicago, Terry Warman, recently retired from AARP Illinois, Mike Ziri from Equality Illinois, and our resident older adult experts, Jean Albright, Don Bell, and Timothy Holt. I also want to acknowledge our funders, AARP Illinois, the LGBTQ Community Fund of, Ch of Chicago Community Trust, and RRF Foundation for Aging. Before the four session advocacy training for LGBT older adults that preceded this breakfast, we developed a six session storytelling training. And I am thrilled to have two tellers from that training who will be sharing a bit about themselves this morning. First up will be Phyllis Johnson, whose pronouns are she, her, hers. Phyllis considers herself a rookie storyteller. She is owned by her two four-legged sons who are happy she is retired and they claim her total focus. Following Phyllis will be Danny Muriello, pronouns she, her, hers. Danny is a senior trans woman and a steadfast advocate for trans inclusion and affirmation. She serves as community member of the Howard Brown Aging Services Advisory Board is active in the Center on Addison Speakers Program and is a member of the SAIC Intergenerational Dialogue Project. She is a parent of four adult children and a grandparent of four granddaughters. So first we're gonna have Phyllis followed by Danny. Take it away, Phyllis. Thank you, Kim. Good morning, everybody. Uh, starting in my mid thirties, I worked at Columbia College Chicago. One day, a new colleague excitedly showed me an article about a greeting card company that was about to bring out a line of cards directed at the lesbian and gay consumer. Good idea, I thought, but why is she showing this to me? A few years later in my mid forties, I came out to myself. I was apparently out to my colleagues already. In fact, I recently re 
realized that I served on the thesis committees of most of the lesbian and gay graduate students in my department. So I was apparently out to my students also. I maintain a warm relationship with my former colleagues and students. My longtime partner, Robbie and I had a great retirement plan. After we quit our jobs and sold our respective homes, we would move to a less extreme climate. Then a friend suggested that maybe we might try living together first. Hmm, a test. As luck would have it, I had just signed a contract for a single family house on the south side of Chicago, closer to her. This house was located in the, the first all black community I had lived in since I was four. Right after I closed on the house uh, in October 2008, she started living there mostly. A month later, she moved in. We lived in the most socially conservative black neighborhood in the city of Chicago. I became active in the West Chesterfield Community Association. We had wonderful neighbors. Our across the street neighbors politely but persistently tried to figure out our relationship. Cousins, sisters, friends, aunt, niece, hmm. In my early 60s, I became a co-peer lead for the Affinities, for Affinity's new 60 plus group, the Trailblazers. Affinity Community Services is, is a South Side based community organization that advocates for and builds community among African American, lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender people. In 2013, we planned a luncheon featuring a speaking, speaker discussing Medicare and its various types of supplements. We promoted this event all over the South Side in lesbian and senior spaces. We had a great turnout including some strangers. Unfortunately, the luncheon coincided with my personal holiday, my birthday. How could I celebrate? I thought long and hard. That year, the Marriage Equality Act had passed effective the following year. I decided to propose to my Robbie. I bought a new outfit, a ring, and wrangled the assignment to be the last speaker closing out the luncheon. As I was talking about all the gifts my association with Affinity, especially the trailblazers it brought me, I realized some guests were not happy to be at a lesbian gay event. I plunged forward, microphone in hand. I began walking towards my intended. One of the strangers, a lady in a pink hat, was vigorously shaking her head. I got down on one knee and proposed. After the proposal, the lady in the pink hat was nowhere to be found. 11 months later, we were married. It was the happiest day of my life. Unfortunately, Robbie was sick at the time of our ceremony. Devastatingly, she died four months later. At her memorial, I was surprised that two groups of neighbors came, our ever inquiring across the street neighbors and a group from the community association. We were good neighbors. In 2017, I was pleased to sit on a panel at the Pride Action Tank AARP Out Aging Summit. This panel focused on community and connections. I was joined on that panel by a manager of a senior center on the South Side. She told us how glad she was that she and her staff had un undergone diversity training. She said she was sure it improved the climate in the center. She also told us a story about how one of her favorite participants had left her a note that he was leaving the center. He loved the activities, he loved the staff but he did not feel welcomed by other participants. I wonder if the lady with the pink hat went to the same center. I am warmly embraced and valued at affinity activities and in my neighborhood. As a widow, I want to expand my contacts. I wonder what my reception would be among older black folks like the lady in the pink hat um, who did not know me as a good neighbor or a good colleague. Would I feel welcomed? Would the pink hat lady be there scowling at me, shaking her head? I have always wondered why diversity training is only given to staff members. The embrace of the other participants is also key to making you feel to want to stay and participate. I do not think it would be too much to ask for agencies with governmental funding to create diversity training for its participants. Thank you.
Good morning, everybody. <clears throat> About two years ago, I began to notice some pain in my lower abdomen. And this was followed by a slowly emerging bulge. After being examined by my doctor, I was told I had a hernia, two hernias in fact, and that soon I should arrange for surgery. She gave me a referral to a hospital in Chicago and I made an appointment to see a surgeon. I wasn't concerned about any risks of the surgery or the outcome. My surgeon was highly skilled, the hospital was top notch, and I was in reasonably good health for my age. My only concern was that my gender identity would not be affirmed. You see, I am a transgender woman, and to be transgender means that one's deeply felt sense of their gender does not conform with the gender they were assigned at birth. In my case, based on certain observed physical characteristics, I was assigned male at birth, and yet I am female through and through. My gender identity is precious to me, and I feel it as a beautiful jewel deep in my heart. Even though I had been intentional in sharing my gender identity with my surgeon and their staff, I wasn't going to leave it to chance that this would be passed on to others at the hospital. I was going to have to advocate for myself. So my therapist and I came up with a plan. It was a simple plan really involving what could be called accessories. My therapist gave me a few message pins with statements such as trans bodies are beautiful and celebrate trans lives and a few others. I also had a stick on name tag. I had no idea how the hospital staff would react. On the day of my surgery, my daughter who would act as both driver and support person saw to it that we left home for the hospital on time to arrive at the ungodly hour of 5.30 a.m. I was wearing comfortable feminine clothing. I had washed my hair, styled it a bit, and applied just a touch of blush on my cheekbones. As my daughter and I entered the hospital, the first thing we noticed was how oddly quiet it was. And with the exception of the, the security person at the door, we didn't see anyone as we made our way to the reception area of the surgery center. After checking in at the desk, I was given a form on a clipboard to fill out. I filled out the form, I returned it, and as I was making my way back to my chair, I hear the receptionist say, sir, excuse me, sir, you need to sign the form. This is an example of what is called misgendering. Simply put, misgendering is referring to someone by the pronouns or honorifics of a gender that is not theirs. This happens to trans people on a daily basis. And when it occurs, it's not too much to say that we feel devastated. I went back to the desk, signed the form, and returned to sit with my daughter. It took me a few minutes to recover. I chose not to correct the, this person, but I was resolved to ensure that I did not get misgendered for the remainder of my stay at the hospital. It wasn't long before the door of the surgery center opened and I heard my name called. I left my bag of belongings with my daughter and followed the staff member. I was led to a curtained private space which had a bed and a chair. I was asked to remove my clothes and put on the gown that was already placed on the bed. I did what I was asked to do and I sat down. Almost immediately I noticed voices with, and within the course of maybe 10 minutes or so, more hospital staff began showing up. And as they did, my anxiety level increased. A member of the nursing staff came to where I was to make sure that I had put on my gown and then went to get my daughter. When my daughter came in, I asked her for my pins with which I proceeded to decorate the front of my gown. I took out my name tag and with a marker I wrote, my pronouns are she, her, and hers. I imagined I looked like I was going to a political campaign event or possibly a baseball game. This was sure to get the attention of the staff. Soon a different nurse came in. They stopped and looked at me and with obvious surprise and confusion. They were especially focused on my name tag and asked, what is that? I explained I was a trans woman and that these were my pronouns. 
They responded, oh, okay, and smiled. I was cautiously hopeful. It wasn't long before others arrived to check my blood pressure, my temperature, my pulse, to read and explain various forms to sign. There must have been a dozen or more people involved with my care. Strangely, with the exception of the first nurse, no one commented on my pins or pronouns. I wondered, were they ig ignoring them? Possibly objecting? Thought I was being ridiculous. I laid back, closed my eyes, thinking about all of this. Then I heard a friendly voice. Good morning, Mrs. Muriello. I'm Mark, and I will be your anesthesiologist today. So obviously word of my gender identity had spread. And although the, the title was relationally incorrect, it was delightfully gender affirming. At that moment, my anxiety disappeared and I became fully relaxed. The remaining several hours are a blur to me. It wasn't until the next day after mostly recovering from the anesthesia that I could think clearly. And I believed then, as I do now, that my gender identity was affirmed. In fact, my daughter told me that in her conversations with the staff, they nearly always used my proper pronouns. I'm convinced that this was due to my self-advocacy, which led to a positive outcome for me. But I wonder, did this influence any changes at the hospital? Would there be a space for conversation about policy I'll never know, but I can't help but think that a tiny seed was planted, and time will tell if it takes root and flourishes. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Coleman Good, and I'm the manager of community organizing at the AIDS Foundation of Chicago. My pronouns are he, him, they, them. I'm going to introduce the great panelists that for our more opening morning discussion. They will each provide a four minute statement to ground our conversation this morning. Our first panelist is Aaron Tax. Aaron Tax is the Director of Advocacy for SAGE. He advocates for LGBT inclusive federal aging policies that account for the unique needs of LGBT older adults. Until 2011, Aaron served as the legal director at Service, Service Members Legal Defense Network, L, the leading organization challenging Don't Ask, Don't Tell in Congress and in courts. He started there as a staff attorney in 2006, and for nearly five years at the SLDN, he took part in a multifaceted approach to advancing the civil rights of LGBT service members through law, policy, outreach, and education. Prior to joining SLDN, Aaron spent three years working for the Department of the Army in the Office of EEU, EEO and Civil Rights. For the first two years as a Presidential Ma Management Fellow, PMF, a graduate of Cornell with honors and distinction at and the George Washington University Law School with honors, he currently resides in Washington, DC. Take it away, Aaron. Thanks so much, I, I really appreciate it. I was on mute for a second. Um, and thanks so much uh, to uh, AIDS Foundation Chicago and Equality Illinois for having me here today. And you know, a huge thanks uh, to our first speakers today, uh, both Phyllis and Danny. I think your stories are really inspirational and they really you know, speak to why we do the work that we do. Um, so my name, uh, uh, as mentioned, is Aaron Tax. My pronouns are he, him and I'm the Director of Advocacy currently at SAGE. And what I'd like to do right now is provide a little bit of the foundation of some of the um, issues we hear about uh, that impact the ability of LGBT older people to age successfully. And I think you'll hear some of these themes, uh, you heard some of them already and you'll continue to hear some of them uh, in the discussions today. The first thing I wanted to highlight is social isolation. This is something that we see you know, quite broadly across the spectrum of LGBT older people. And uh, of course, this is something that's been exacerbated by COVID-19. So why does this social isolation exist? There can be a number of causes, but generally speaking, we see that this is a paid population that's twice as likely to be single and four times less likely to have kids than their heterosexual and cisgender counterparts. 
And as a result, it means that by and large, many LGBT older people are facing the aging process all alone. So whether it's something you know like needing help changing a light bulb that's hard to get to, or getting help uh, like Danny had and getting to the doctor, people don't always have those family members um, around them who can help them through life's challenges. And it also impacts things like you know the upcoming holiday season. You know if you're facing the holidays all alone. Uh, or you have no one to even see on a, a given weekend or a day of the week, it could really take a toll on people psychologically. And we know, of course, that there's a tie between you know, psychological health and uh, physical health, mental health and physical health. And you know, that's certainly something that we see with respect to LGBT older people. Another big challenge that we see uh, is higher rates of poverty. And this is particularly pronounced among lesbian older, older couples with twice the poverty rate of their heterosexual counterparts. And again, um, you know, this is something that can impact people's ability to age successfully. And to flesh that out a little bit, you might be wondering, well, why is that the case? I was speaking to an older lesbian in one of our senior centers and asked her what it was like to come of age as a lesbian and what her work history was like. And she said that every time she came out uh, or was outed on the job, she had to move on. And you can imagine someone like that uh, you know, wouldn't be able to progress a lot in her career. And you can imagine all sorts of stories like that about how being LGBT identified can impact people's ability to earn a living. In addition, unfortunately, in a way, it's the gift that keeps on giving because we still see some of the vestiges of discrimination now with respect to social security benefits and other government benefits. Because if people's uh, relationships weren't recognized back in the day, um, they might not be able to get to the same amount of social security benefits as their heterosexual or cisgender counterparts. Finally, I wanted to talk about a lack of access to culturally competent services and supports. And even though that LGBT older people are in greater need of social su services and supports because of the higher rates of poverty and the higher rates of social isolation, they might be less likely to be able to access those culturally competent services and supports that they need to remain independent. And um, I see I'm coming up short on my four minutes here, so I'll leave it at that and we can always discuss that a little bit more later. Um, so with that, I'd like to turn it back uh, uh, to Coleman uh, for our next speaker. Thank you, Aaron. Our next speaker is Jacqueline Boyd of The Care Plan. Jacqueline Boyd is a passionate LGBTQ plus advocate with over 15 years of expertise in senior care. Jacqueline has built the country's premier LGBTQ plus centered care management company. The Care Plan's groundbreaking model of client directed care provides advocacy, care navigation, and advanced planning for successful aging experiences. Simultaneously, the company supplies training, strategic planning, and infrastructural support to nonprofits, businesses, and community groups across the U.S. At the helm of the Care Plan's leadership, Jacqueline has consulted with, the, with national and local organizations such as SAGE, Diverse Elders Coalition, and AIDS Foundation Chicago to enhance services offered to LGBTQ older adults. Jacqueline is a, is a sought after speaker and the author providing businesses leadership through pre presentations at the American Society on Aging National Conference, Creating Change Conference, the Los Angeles County Older Adult Summit and University of Chicago, among others. She recently contributed a chapter to the Transgender and Gender Nonconforming Health and Aging, available from Springer Publishing and authored the guide, Create Your Care Plan, an LGBT person's group uh, sorry, LGBT Persons Guide to Preparing for Medical Procedures. Currently, Jacqueline serves as the co-chair of One Roof Chicago. An integrational LGBTQ plus focused housing project is on the advisory council of Pride Action Tank. She is also, she is also a co-founder for Project Fierce Chicago. All right, Jacqueline, let's hear it. <laughs> I think we might have already heard it. <laughs> Sorry for uh, for my bio taking four minutes and good morning, everyone. It is wonderful to be with you. Uh, I am honored to be here as I think that LGBTQ plus older adults have a really unique aging process that we are just beginning to understand. We are right now seeing the first generations to age out of the closet to age with HIV, and to age with any options. And there are still too few options here in Illinois. 
for the majority of my career in aging, there I witnessed that there was little training for physicians. Physicians only get about three hours of diversity training in medical school, and that's not enough to understand uh, the needs of LGBTQ older adults. The lack of awareness and competency within health and aging systems is affecting health outcomes, social opportunities for meaningful connection, and participation in traditional senior services. LGBTQ plus seniors may not feel safe in healthcare and aging settings, and so they're not taking advantage of those services. These lack of options are exacerbated when we look at rural areas in the state as well. As Aaron shared, there's a number of common concerns that LGBTQ older adults have, primary among them, isolation and loneliness, which you can imagine has only worsened in the time of the pandemic, but also housing and finances and care support. Who will be there to care for our elders if there's not family of origin involved, or children um, or close friends who are able to provide that support? In LGBTQ communities, we see two and a half times the rate of mental health issues and substance misuse issues. And these mental health needs are really reaching, in my perspective, a crisis point with COVID-19. Uh, I'm particularly concerned about what's happening in this pandemic for LGBTQ elders and what will happen in the years ahead. We've already lost some of our LGBTQ clients. And from my perspective, the loneliness, the isolation, that feeling of being penned in and a fear of going to the hospital are all playing a major role. So many in our communities are grieving in this moment and have real concerns about what is coming next. In spite of the challenges that they face, LGBTQ plus older adults are an amazingly diverse group and bring a lot of resiliencies to the table. I think these can be further explored and leveraged to build pathways to healthy aging for all Illinoisans. You heard from our storytellers at the beginning, and there is no one story. There is no one way that LGBT older adults are aging. Some are embracing the process. Some are taking it day by day. Others didn't expect to reach this stage in life and are feeling unprepared. I continue to be inspired by the many strategies our seniors are using to age well and the ways that they're leading, even without a roadmap or role models. Chosen family, a history of caregiving for each other, communal living, telling their stories. These are some of the ways that LGBTQ older adults are leading in the field of aging. Another real reason in my mind for a commission here in Illinois is the lack of knowledge around the needs of LGBTQ caregivers. There's a lot of informal caregiving that happens and many people that we work with don't even identify as caregivers. That's not language that they're familiar with. They're just being a good friend or a good partner. So we don't have a real clear idea of their needs and even a less clear idea of how to serve them. LGBTQ folks are often caring for the older adults in their family or disabled family members as well. In my opinion, there's just a huge opportunity to better understand these needs and of both LGBTQ aging folks and caregivers. We all deserve choice care and a supportive aging experience. You are a critical piece of that puzzle. I wanna thank you for the strides you have already made in this state. And I really look forward to seeing what we can all do together in the future. And thank you to the team who put together this breakfast today. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here. Thank you. And finally, last but definitely not least, we have Jeff Berry. Jeff Berry has been with TPAN and Positively Aware Magazine since 1992, and has served as editor since 2005. He is co-founder of the Reunion Project for Long-Term Survivors of HIV. He is also co-chair of the Getting to Zero uh, Older Adults and Long-Term Survivors Working Group, a member of Illinois PrEP Working Group and the Community Collaboration Board, CCB, of the Third Coast Center of AIDS Research. CFAR, the Pri Fair Pricing Coalition, and the AIDS Treatment Activist Coalition. Barry resides in Chicago, Illinois, with his husband, Stephen, and their three furry kids. Take it away, Barry. Jeff. Thank you, Coleman, and um, thank you, Aaron and Jackie, for setting the uh, stage here in this panel. Um, 
Once again, my name is Jeff Berry. My pronouns are he, him, and his. And I'm the director of publications at TPAN here in Chicago. Um, I'm a long-term survivor of HIV. I'm also a gay man who is aging with HIV. I was diagnosed in 1989 at the age of 30. It was a scary time as our friends were dying and there were no effective treatments until at least seven or eight years later. I was one of the lucky ones, but I deal with survivor's guilt as a result, as do many other long-term survivors of HIV. The trauma of losing and burying numerous lovers, friends, and family, and the stigma that many of us endured during that time and still do to this day has left many of us with post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD, substance use issues, um, cognitive problems, early frailty, and other aging-related conditions, including bone, renal, and cardiovascular issues, which are appearing earlier in life than our aging HIV-negative counterparts. Many mental health issues, including isolation, which Aaron uh, talked about, depression and suicidality are coming to the surface and being magnified during the COVID pandemic. Over half of people living with HIV uh, now are over the age of 50 and by 2030 here in the US and by 2030, it's estimated that 70% will be over the age of 50. As a population ages, comprehensive and culturally appropriate and competent services are needed for older adults with HIV, including LGBTQ older adults and long-term survivors. When we think of, uh, typically think of long-term survivors, we think of those who are older, who were diagnosed 10, 20, or 30 years ago or more, and are now aging with HIV. But people who acquired HIV at or around birth or early in life and have now lived with HIV for decades are long-term survivors in their own right and have needs that are similar, such as the trauma of losing many friends to AIDS, but also unique, such as struggling with adherence to HIV medications and navigating adolescence in the face of HIV and AIDS. Any of the work we do in HIV and aging must also address systemic and structural racism, inequities in access to care and treatment, while advocating and promoting the rights of LGBTQ individuals. Over three quarters of people living with HIV over the age of 50 are LGBTQ. 3% of people living with HIV are people of trans experience. And not all long-term survivors are alike. People with over the age of 70 will have needs uh, that are different than people who are maybe 50 years old or 45. We need providers, including geriatricians who are trained to deliver culturally competent care and services to these populations and provide education and support services that are tailored to their needs. Lastly, I'd like to say that many of us never expected to be here. We were told we wouldn't live this long, but here we are living in a society that really doesn't value its elders or what they can teach us. We have an opportunity to take advantage of that wisdom by seeking their input on issues that will affect their lives and that matter most living out our golden years in good health with dignity and respect. I'll stop here, but I wanna thank the organizers for giving me the opportunities to speak here today on behalf of people living, aging and thriving with HIV. Thank you. Hi, good morning, everyone. <clears throat> I wanna thank Coleman, Jackie, Aaron and Jeff for that very powerful panel that we were just able to experience. My name is Elizabeth Heber. My pronouns are they, them, and theirs. And I'm a staff attorney at the Center for Disability and Elder Law located in Chicago, Illinois. I'm here today to discuss a policy initiative to establish the Illinois Commission on LGBT Aging. If enacted, the commission will survey the LGBT aging experience in Illinois and make recommendations to ensure LGBT elders can age equitably and with pride. And while our panelists outlined a lot of the reasons why this commission is necessary. This is an opportunity to be the first state in the country to enact a permanent commission dedicated to LGBT aging for those very reasons. Many LGBT elders have experienced lifetimes of discrimination that affect aging outcomes. LGBT elders are more likely to rely on social service providers for support, but many will delay care for fear of discrimination. They're also more likely to experience social isolation and are at risk of financial exploitation and abuse. A permanent commission will make sure that LGBT elders in Illinois 
receive the support they need and provide ongoing guidance to service providers across the state to improve the aging experience of LGBT elders. Our ultimate goal is to ensure that LGBT elders can age equitably and with pride. So if enacted, the Illinois Commission on Aging Act will create a committee comprised of legislators, government officials, stakeholders, and LGBT elders themselves. It would be tasked with examining the impact of state policies and regulations on LGBT elders and make recommendations to ensure equitable access to treatment, care, and benefits. In doing so, it would examine the impact of race, ethnicity, class, sexual orientation, and gender identity across LGBT elder aging outcomes. The commission will also examine strategies to increase provider awareness of the needs of LGBT elders and of their caregivers and to improve the competence of and access to treatment, services, and ongoing care. This includes preventative care and assessment of the funding and programming needed to enhance services to, to the growing population of LGBT elders in Illinois. Finally, the commission shall examine best practices to increase access, reduce isolation, prevent abuse and exploitation, promote independence and self-determination, strengthen a history of caregiving that exists in the LGBT aging histories, eliminate disparities, and ultimately improve quality of life for LGBT elders across the state. Some aspects of the Illinois Commission on Aging Act will be determined in the following months, including some language regarding where it will be housed and where, how it will be staffed, of which I'll keep you apprised. Uh, but to conclude, I want to thank Director Basta for meeting with me this week to provide feedback and guidance on the administration of the commission. And I look forward to future conversations to develop this commission into a robust resource for LGBT elders across Illinois. I want to thank Representative Anna Moeller and Senator Ron Villavallam for also meeting with me and for their interest in sponsoring this legislation. I want to thank Pride Action Tank and Equality Illinois for supporting this effort through all of its iterations. Um, and I want to thank all of all of those in attendance today. Please continue, continue to center the experiences, needs, and joys of LGBT elders in your lives, practice, and your work. This is an opportunity to finally lift up and call into light the experiences of the elders of the LGBT community. And to me, as a member of the LGBT community myself, no act is as important or as humbling as bringing the needs, experiences, and desires of the elders of my community into a public focus. I humbly ask for your support of this policy initiative in the coming months. The Illinois Commission on Aging Act is dedicated to this community. Supporting it supports LGBT elders across Illinois. Um, thank you so much for this opportunity to, to introduce this idea to you today. Um, I'd like to introduce Mike Ziri from Equality Illinois to moderate our next panel. Thank you. Thanks so much, Elizabeth, uh, and thanks so much, everyone. Um, my name is Mike Ziri. I'm the Director of Public Policy at Equality Illinois. My pronouns are he, him, his, and I am very excited to be part of this event today, uh, and I really value and thank Pride Action Tank for inviting Equality Illinois to be part of this work. It's just so exciting, and uh, thank you to all the panelists who've spoken. Thank you to all the attendees, and now I am... Um, I'm excited to be part of this next panel where we talk with three amazing policy leaders. Uh, but first, because I've, I've seen a lot of great champions and friends from the legislature in the, in the program, uh, I want to give a shout out real quick to those who I've seen. And I apologize if I miss anybody, but uh, you know, uh, uh, thank you, Illinois House Majority Leader Greg Harris. Thank you, Representative Moeller, Representative Didich, um, Representative Cassidy, Representative LaPointe. Uh, Representative West, Representative Costa Howard, uh, Representative Stewart, Representative Mason, Representative Bob Morgan, Representative Sam Yingling, Senator Julie Morrison, Senator uh, Christina Castro, Senator Sarah Feigenholz, uh, former state rep Dave Olson. I see, I see Representative former rep Olson in the in the uh, audience as well. And also want to recognize um, several of our newly elected folks who have joined us today. So Senator elect Meg Capel, uh, Representative elect D. Avalar. Um, Representative-elect Stoneback, Representative-elect Yang Roar, Representative-elect Croak, and Representative-elect uh, Maura Hirschauer. Thank you for joining us this morning and for being part of this and for all the advocacy and, and leadership you've shown um, and uh, will show in the coming years to advance justice for LGBTQ people, especially LGBTQ older adults and older adults living with HIV. Um, so now it's my honor to be able to moderate a panel with three champion 
uh, amazing policy leaders um, who have done work around LGBT issues facing LGBT older adults and who are going to keep doing that work. And uh, State Senator Ron Villavallum, um, uh, uh, State Representative Teresa Ma, and the Director of the Illinois Department of Aging, Paula Basta. Um, I think uh, y'all are all on. I see you. So it's great to see you all this morning. And, um, you know, just want to just jump into it. Um, last year, Pride Action Tank, Equality Illinois, and SAGE worked with Representative Ma and Senator Villavallum on a, a truly exciting and we think historic piece of legislation, um, Senate Bill 1319, um, which is a bill that will advance justice and equity for LGBT older adults and older adults living with HIV. Um, and really, really exciting. Um, Illinois became the third with this bill. Illinois became the third state in the country to identify LGBT older adults as a population of greatest social need for aging programming. And really exciting, Illinois became the first state in the country to identify older adults living with HIV as a population of greatest social need for inclusion in aging programming. So really exciting that Illinois is leading the Midwest and a leader nationally. Uh, and I think maybe uh, uh, one or two jurisdictions have followed our lead since then. So really exciting to see Illinois at the forefront of that work. Um, and you know, as, as I said, Senator Villavallum and Representative Ma were the chief sponsors of that bill. I know we had fun uh, going through committee. Kim, I know Kim was one of our, uh, in the house was a, um, was a witness and Serena Worthington, who I see on was a witness in the Senate. Um, so really exciting. Um, and I just want to get right down to our questions um, um, to be you know, cognizant of time to make sure we uh, get through my prepared questions, but also audience questions. So if you have questions, um, please put them in the chat box. Uh, and then after this panel, we'll, we'll try to get to many of those as possible. And they could be questions for these you know, great policymakers, but they could be questions also for any of the previous panelists as well. We'll have time uh, to, to answer questions. Um, so just want to start right off um, with Senator Villavallon, Representative Ma. Um, and I, I kind of, you know, talked about Senate Bill 13-9 a little bit. Um, but what does the bill do, um, Representative Ma and Senator Villavallon? So, um, hi, everybody. Uh, I'm State Representative Teresa Ma. My pronouns are uh, she, her, hers, and uh, it's really an honor to join you all on this panel, um, and uh, I'm proud to have been one of the chief sponsors of the bill. Um, the bill adds LGBT older adults as a population of um, greatest social need to um, the uh, programs on aging, as, as well as uh, HIV positive LGBT older adults um, as well. And uh, it uh, just adds these groups uh, as uh, groups that deserve to be uh, protected and um, afforded the same rights as everyone else. And I'm really proud to be part of a state that um, has been a leader in um, adding these protections and um, proud to have worked on the legislation. And I'll just go ahead and jump in. Good morning, everyone. It's great to be with you. Uh, as was mentioned, my name is Ron Villavellum. I'm the state senator for the 8th district. My pronouns are he, him, his. Uh, I just want to thank you all for, for inviting us to be on and uh, a part of this discussion. Thank you so much to those who have shared their stories and to our colleagues for supporting this legislation. And, and just would echo what Representative Ma has said, uh, which is uh, essentially this legislation, uh, you know, and I think something that we have to continue to focus on, uh, it looks at uh, the injustices and the oversights, quite frankly, that current the previous laws have ex that have uh, been in place uh, as it relates to the LGBTQ community. And so we, we looked at uh, what was happening and, and, you know, just one part of the law, for example, uh, adding the non-discrimination language uh, to assisted living facilities. There's already non-discrimination language to other types of facilities and other communities. 
Uh, and so extending that uh, to assisted living facilities and, and making sure uh, the LGBTQ community is included, uh, that's just you know, another a step that we need to continue to, to take uh, as we move forward. And so uh, it is, it is uh, uh, great that we were able to work on it, get it passed uh, with, without any opposition, I believe. Uh, and so that, that also makes a statement about how we're progressing as a state. And um, I also, you know, would lastly add, you know, th our thanks to uh, the director and the department for working with us uh, on this legislation as well. And, you know, Senator, you, you've mentioned the other part of the bill about assisted living facilities and non-discrimination protections in long-term care facilities. Um, for, for both of you, Representative Ma and Senator Billabong, um, when we talked about the idea was about for the bill, what, was there something was there a particular issue? What 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 motivated you to say yes to us? You know what what? Please. Yes. Yeah. So um, I I represent a very diverse district that includes a lot of older adults as well as um, immigrants, um, communities of color. I've long been a champion of civil rights and um, equality, equity, um, and I you know, don't think that the experience should be any different for LGBTQ older adults. Um, I grew up in San Francisco and um, I grew up in a very diverse environment that included um, many, many LGBTQ folks um, who are close to me and, you know, the, we're all facing these issues um, in aging. And so I think that, you know, everyone should be afforded equal protections. I think that's, I think that's right on, you know, well, first of all, I would say who can say, who can say no to Brian Johnson and Mike Ziri? Uh, I, I certainly, I certainly couldn't. Uh, but, but, you know, Representative Ma uh, was, was, was the first Asian American elected to the Illinois General Assembly. Uh, I was uh, the first Asian American elected to the Illinois State Senate. And I think, you know, something that she said, uh, uh, you know, became personal to me as well, which is growing up, I, I saw the discrimination, I saw the uh, injustices that my parents faced, my mom faced. And, you know, there were times where, you know, we, we as a community, uh, and, and also just individuals, um, you know, we said, no, 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 let's, Let's ignore it. Let's let's just put our head down and do our work and and and, and be done. Uh, but I think there was a point that, that came, which it, it basically you know in the '90s and 2000s, that 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 my community at large said enough is enough. You know, and and we're going to stand up and we're going to speak out and we're and we're going to make sure that we correct the wrongs. Uh, that have existed uh, for, for some time. And, and so that's been really, you know, how I viewed legislation in general is we need to go back and look at our laws and, and really um, make sure we understand what, uh, you know, what we can do to uh, not only achieve equality, but, but achieve equity as well. And, and, and so um, that's something that's very, you know, personal to me. I'll also add, you know, and this is why people uh, sharing their stories are so important, um, you know, and, and we, get, we get down in Springfield and we start talking drafting language and, you know, how to move people from opposition to neutral and, um, how, you know, I'll go talk about all the process, but it all starts with people. And, and in my district, uh, there was a, a lady named uh, Marsha Wetzel who, who faced discrimination in an assisted living facility. And she is the one that quite frankly inspired all of us uh, to move this forward because she said, no, I am not going to accept this discrimination. Uh, you know, she experienced the isolation that our uh, story, our, our folks that shared their stories uh, uh, prior to our panel uh, were talking about. Uh, with LGBTQ elders, and she took them to court, and she went all the way to the the U.S. Uh, circuit, circuit Appeals. And so, when we talk about why we do this, it's because of people like her, and it's because of what she stood up and said. Hey, if she can stand up and and and, and speak for for herself, then we have to, as legislators, uh, make sure that we have laws in the books that can speak up for her and others uh, that may not feel like they can. 
Great, thank you. And I'm um, glad you mentioned um, Marsha Wetzel, uh, who is just, a, you know, was a legal champion, um, passed away a few weeks ago. So we, we, I think, honor her memory and legacy by fighting and continuing this work. Um, so thank you both. And now I want to just turn with my next question to uh, Director Basta. Um, we know implementation of a law is extremely important. Um, passing the laws is, is, is difficult and important work, but implementation is key. Um, what kind of work is the Department on Aging doing um, with the area agencies on aging or other organizational partner and department partners to help implement this law and make sure that, that providers know about their obligations? So Director Basta, thank you for joining us. Today. Sure, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for uh, inviting me to be on the panel and, and also to be part of this amazing group of people today. Um, again, humbled and honored to be part of the conversation and to be part of this with you. My name is Paula Basta. My preferred pronouns are she, her, hers. Um, Phyllis, I, I wanna give you a shout out about your story because I don't know if you know, but my myself, Terry, my wife and I, Terry Warman and I were there when you got on your knee, bended knee and proposed to Bobby. So that you tell that story is so, so powerful and still amazing to me um, as to how we were all with you on that amazing, on that terrific day. Um, I also think that you all need to know, and, and I think you probably all do, that I was appointed by Governor Pritzker in March of 2019. And it was right around that time that the bill, Senate Bill 1319 was just passed. And as an out older lesbian, and I'm proud, I'm owning it, I can tell you that that was such a, a wonderful thing to say that we, we know for a fact we have a lot of work to do. And we know also for a fact that um, the Department on Aging is our state unit on aging, and we are the ones who get the federal dollars from the Administration on Community Living um, that gets all the dollars that go and flow through to our providers on a practical level that do the work and do the um, all the services and programs to our older adults. And so it's very important to me. This is not just because it's personal, of course, because maybe it's very personal, but it's also because it is the right thing to do. And it is important and incredibly important that we make sure that we have culturally competent and inclusive programming with older adults, all older Illinoisans throughout the state of Illinois. So how do we do that? You know, all of you who know me, um, and I do see so many names and, and amazing faces of my colleagues and people that I've worked with for years in aging, know that I'm a practitioner. Uh, I'm not known to be that policy wonk. I love my policy wonk sisters and brothers out there who are much better than I, but I'm a practitioner. And so to that end, what we did early on when I became director was that I uh, worked with my team and said, we will do SAGE care training. And what that means is that SAGE, which is the organization that Aaron Tax works for, um, which is a national organization, gave the Department on Aging and our provider agencies through a series of trainings that we all went through around LGBT competency issues. And so I can honestly say that in January of 2020, we had completed all the trainings and were given the platinum sponsorship that now is actually on our website that does show that we are an LGBT aging friendly state unit on aging throughout the country where one of, um, and probably Aaron knows this, one of a few states that have done this. It is a commitment and it is our commitment. It is not just mine, but it is our team's commitment at IDOA that we make sure that we highlight and also continue to make sure that we're doing sensitive trainings and also making sure that programs are happening that are going to be inclusive. I, I think that what I'd like to do is highlight the work of the area agencies on aging. There are 13 AAAs, area agencies on aging, and those are throughout the state who are overseeing programs and services. Um, for example, I'm gonna shout out our area agent, our, our PSA uh, AAA uh, uh, area two, which is Age Guide. Age Guide is uh, suburban Cook County and they have done LGBT sensitivity training with SAGE. And they have also actually uh, had Jack, our own, our very own Jacqueline Boyd, who has come out to do uh, uh, trainings with that group and has basically 
made sure that they looked at their policies, procedures, the way that they actually have their providers do work and that they are LGBT inclusive. They make sure that their websites are hopefully and very much highlighting LGBT inclusive programming. Our PSA 3, which is Western Illinois Area Agency on Aging, works with a collaboration of a host of agencies throughout the um, area that we have in Western Illinois that are LGBT inclusive. Um, I wanna give another shout out to our uh, PSA 7, which is Age Link, which is here in Springfield. I don't know if you know, but right now I'm actually in Springfield. Um, the Department on Aging is an agency that has 157 employees, about 130 of which are in uh, Springfield. So I'm actually here this week with my, my Springfield peeps, um, working on, of course, everything COVID including vaccines, fingers crossed, right folks? Um, but I want you to know that even here in Springfield that Age Link, which is the area agency on aging in Springfield, Illinois, has Sage Platinum certification as well with the Phoenix Center. That all their staff has been inclusively trained and um, is basically on track to make sure that all of their demographics are being captured in their intake forms. Uh, also want to highlight, of course, our friends at Age Options, PSA 13, which is, again, suburban Cook County, doing amazing work with our LGBT older adults and highlighting the services that Age Options does through uh, things like Pride Cafes, which are very exciting. And I'm so grateful to Jackie Boyd and, and Aaron and my other colleagues, but talking about social isolation is key. Unfortunately, we, all, we don't know what we're gonna find when we finally get to the other side of COVID. But I can tell you that it worries me greatly because of the social isolation and just the factors of how devastating this pandemic has been to our older adults. Um, I'm gonna get a little weepy and I'm gonna try not to, but it has been incredibly um, overwhelming to see how how this has been a, a pandemic that has affected our older adults. But I have to tell you that our aging network continues to be strong and resilient in, may, in many ways that I have just been blown away. And, and I, I'm telling you, we have a lot of work to do, and I know that, but I'm also saying that there is a lot of good work that is being done. Obviously, because of things like SB 1319, um, Senator Villa Valams, uh, Representative Ma, rep really all of the, the different legislators and of course our governor who is so LGBT committed to LGBT issues and equality that we are very, very grateful that we have so much work to do but we are doing the hard work together. Um, and I wanna make sure that we highlight that and make sure that we know that this is essentially important to all of us. Um, making sure that our forms are doing are inclusive, making sure that we do what is in our, our CCP program, which is our community care program, our person-centered planning, which is something that we want to make sure that we are doing with all the programs that we have. Um, LGBT older adults face barriers. We know that. And it receives, and we need to make sure that we highlight all those barriers so that we can overcome them. I want to make sure that you know that we are doing things as trying to work in collaboration with the people like Pride Action Tank. I'm glad that Elizabeth gave the shout out about it. We're talking about a commission that hopefully may be formed in the state of Illinois. It's modeled after our friends in the state of Massachusetts. So we want to make sure we know that we can do things that are going to again highlight the experience of LGBT elders growing older throughout the state of Illinois. So uh, SAGE care training, we have our AAAs that are doing amazing work on the ground and being LGBT inclusive. Um, happy to also take questions. I don't know, is that okay? Uh, if you live specifically in an area of the state of Illinois, but I'm also wanting to make sure that you know that we are here for you, that, um, that people need to know that they are not aging alone, especially all of our LGBT elders. We are here to make sure that we hopefully bring to you the cultural and the best programming we can possibly give you um, as you grow older. It, it's, it's just, I can tell you too, that it, these are scary days. These are scary times. Um, 
I think we're going to need to really do a lot of outreach and education around the vaccine. We want to make sure people know, get your flu shot right now. That's something you can do that will help kind of boost and bolster your immune system as you age. Um, and I just think that I want to tell you that it's very important um, that we hear from the voices of those of you who are out there and that you continue to be engaged with all of us doing the work day in and day out. I'm so glad that Senator Villavalam did that shout out um, and says it's about people. And I know Representative Ma knows it's all about people. Um, the work of Equality Illinois knows it's about people. And as Kim Hunso articulately opened us today and said, Pride Action Tank, none of this work that they do can be done alone. Kim, none of the work that all of us do can be done alone. That's why we need each other. So with that, I'll, I'll end, but I'll also just say thank you for this time. Hey, thank you, Director, as well. Uh, uh, and you answered my next question, which was all, what are all the various programs and services that the agency provides for LGBT older adults and older adults living with HIV? And um, I loved hearing your, 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 your your, your just comments because I have learned a lot and I will say also I'm sure you're in the DNR building um, where I used to work at DNR so I'm very familiar with your offices uh, I was two floors up uh, but I know exactly where you are and you must have a very beautiful view <laughs> so um, but uh, and also really happy to hear as someone from Springfield happy to hear that the Phoenix Center which is Springfield's LGBTQ community center is is certified um, to to provide top-notch programming and services to LGBT older adults and older adults with HIV. Uh, that really makes me excited as, as someone from Springfield. Um, and you've heard throughout the program different policy ideas. And I just kind of um, wanna, wanna ask you about some of those different ones and your thoughts and what you think um, could be done legislatively. Uh, but first I wanna remind folks to, if you have questions, please put them in the chat box or the Q&A box. I think we've had two or three questions so far and some of them touch on the things that um, um, Senator Villabon, Representative Ma and Director Voss have, have talked about. So we'll be getting to those in just a few minutes. Um, so please add your questions. Um, we'd love to be able to ask those of all of our panelists. Um, but we've heard today about some different policy ideas, uh, cultural competency trainings, the, the Commission on LGBT Aging, um, different programs, et cetera. Um, and I guess this is probably a question for Senator Villaval and Representative Ma, um, but what is the mood of the General Assembly to take further action on, on measures that advance equity for LGBT older adults and older adults living with HIV? I think that um with the near unanimous support of SB 1319, that we should take that as an indication of uh, potential support for the ideas that have been mentioned, including a commission on um, LGBTQ uh, um, older adults and, um, you know, whatever form cultural competency training um, would take. I think those are all great ideas that um, I think would um, get um, a lot of support among my colleagues. I, I agree. And I, I would just add, you know, we, we're, we're at a time where uh, what I would say, uh, what I would characterize as uh, phrases are, are very popular. Uh, you know, we, and, and, and they should be, you know, we, we, um, we say thank you to our essential workers. Uh, we say that we stand um, for equality and equity, and you you know you start to see not only you know corporations and, and and organizations that represent workers and others, you know use these phrases and, and affirm these phrases. Uh, well, there needs to be policy that backs these phrases up, and and so um, you know that would be that would be kind of uh, my charge to 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 folks on this uh, Zoom today is. We need to know what policies will back those phrases up, hold us accountable, hold not just as legislators, but our state, residents of our state accountable uh, to say, look, if you really truly are believe in a phrase uh, like uh, equality and equity for the LGBTQ community, 
then you need to support this policy as well. Um, it's not just saying the words. Uh, and so um, I, I do believe we're at a moment in, in our time, in our history, that um, we can accomplish a great deal. Uh, we need the ideas and we need to hear from folks uh, uh, on the importance of these ideas. And I think we can get them done. I think that's excellent. And, um, you know, you're, you're all certainly hearing a lot of ideas today, a lot of stories. So, uh, you know, we'll see over the coming months and, you know, year, years, if we can turn those into concrete policies. Um, and I also want to say, I just, I know both of you are very aware of this and, uh, but, you know, we're committed to also doing this work. As we talk about cultural competency trainings in long-term care facilities, uh, an important partner has to also be labor. Um, and I know, uh, you know our friends at SEIU Healthcare who represent you know, the essential workers in these facilities just had uh, a big victory uh, last week. And it's just important that we work with the folks you know, who are doing this great work, this important work. Um, and I, I see Representative Moss at Evolve, Bill Vaughn. I, I think about you know, our friends in labor and the essential workers. Um, uh, um, and we've gotten, you know, since I asked that question, we've gotten like four uh, questions from the audience. So I actually, um, I'm gonna ask one more question and then we'll jump into audience questions because there's some really great audience questions. Um, Elizabeth uh, spoke about the idea for the commission and just wanna, um, um, I know Director Basta, you mentioned uh, you like the idea. Of course, you know, we have to just, uh, look at the legislation. Um, Senator Bill Obama said, Ma, what are your thoughts on um, an entity like that for LGBT aging issues? I'm all for it. I think it's a great idea. And um, like I said, I, I believe that it is something that um, will get um, widespread support from among my colleagues once it's proposed. Well, um, you know, I think uh, Elizabeth uh, referenced the fact that I would I would uh, be uh, willing to sponsor it in the Senate. So I, I think that kind of gives away where I stand on the issue. Uh, I will add, though, that my conversation with Elizabeth and just just to be, you know, tell have it with everybody. Um, you know, we, we, we I certainly support it. I think the question is. Uh, you know, we, number one, we, we have a number of boards and commissions in the state of Illinois, and we should. Uh, there, there are a number of different issues that we need to, to highlight and have community members engaged in and, and get their input and, um, you know, have that, that, that process. You know, however, that, that, that also means that we have to stay vigilant on uh, the effectiveness of, this, of these commissions and boards, um, make sure that they, they're not uh, vacant. They need to, they need to you know, be, have members appointed to them. Uh, we need to make sure we're reading their reports uh, and, and, and you know, make sure that we're utilizing them to the best of our abilities. Uh, the second piece of that is you know, there, there is a Council on Aging, and, and Director uh, Basta knows more about this than I do, but there is a Council on Aging. And so you know, I think uh, we, we certainly they have a, a purpose and a, and, and a, a makeup. And so I would be interested to see, you know, if there is any synergy or if there's any collaboration that, that could be, that can happen with, with that council and this uh, commission as well. So, um, look, th again, I, I support it, I, I, but I always, you know, like to look at, uh, some of these other aspects to make sure that, um, you know, we're not just doing something to have have it, you know, and 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 put it up. I want to make sure we we really uh, get to the purpose of what we're trying to achieve. Great, thank you both. Um, so now I'm going to launch into questions, and um, it's hard to pick the best one. You know, like there's so many great questions, and we'll try to get through all of them um, before the end of our program today. But uh, I'll start with a, a question from um, from Hugh Cole. Uh, and I, you know, this is a question for for all the panelists, um, so anyone can can jump in. How can we best address the fears that have amplified among LGBT older adults due to COVID-related indifference to the suffering and devaluation of older adults on the national stage? Well, I, I I'll just jump in and say, on a national stage, I think it's encouraging that we have a new administration starting January twentieth of twenty twenty one. I think that's for sure. 
there's hope on the horizon on the national stage. Let me just say that we know that. Um, the other, but the other part of what I believe Department on Aging is at the state level is charged with as we roll out the vaccine is to is outreach and education amongst all our older adults. And I think in, in essence, for Hugh Cole to ask that question, I think it's it's so important that we all be part of the outreach and the education that has to happen. That you talk to your neighbors and your friends and your your other LGBT friends and people who are older and say, you know, what is it that you need? How is it that you need to have services or access services, but that you really do want to be part of encouraging people to utilize the services that are always available to you and not be discouraged or be afraid to access services because you're LGBT. That is key. That is key. And that you tell those of us who are also part of providing those services, if in fact there is a problem that someone has not given you what you are, what you are due. Because we need to know on the other end of providing service that if we are falling short, what, that who is it that's falling short and how is that happening and hold us accountable. And I think that's also important. So education and outreach, both a two-way street of letting us know if you are accessing services, are you getting what you need? If you're not, why not? And get put us on, you know, on notice that that's not happening. We do the best we can, of course, but it, we can always do better. So I don't know if I quite answered it all, but maybe I, I hope that you, that you know that we are continuing to have these conversations and we'll help any way we can. Great, thank you, Director. Uh, did any of our other panelists want to uh, you know, respond to that question before I move to our next one? I would just, I would just add, it's, it's through conversations like this. It's through conversations like this that uh, we're able to hear people's stories, uh, understand their fears, change policy, but also just having a place to come and share and 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 have a community. Uh, I think, you know, is, is incredibly important. And yes, amen to a new administration. Uh, thank you. Um, so uh, question, uh, another great question. What opportunities are there to collaborate with those of us in downstate organizations? And this comes from Jerry and Tim, uh, who are volunteers with Uniting Pride of Champaign County, the Uniting Pride Center, great organization in Champaign County, uh, focusing on the needs of LGBTQ community, and working with local agencies. So what opportunities are there to collaborate uh, with downstate organizations? Well, I would say that for sure, you could look at our AAAs in that area. Uh, I believe that it is our, um, both PSA five and six, the West Central Illinois and the East Central Illinois. I think that all of them are, are available to you. If you go to our website, which is www.illinois.aging, um, I think that you could see on the map of Illinois, depending what county you're in, what area agency you is represented there. And I would encourage you to reach out to them, obviously. Uh, if you're looking for LGBT specific organizations, I don't know, Mike Zeri, maybe you'd be better to answer that with the Equality Illinois being a statewide organization, maybe you have more specific agencies that are in place. But if, if this person is looking for working with older adults and LGBT older adults, I would say that your area agency on aging would be the one to, to go ahead and reach out to. So I'm not sure if that complete, you know, completely answers it, but. Great, thank you. Um, and I would also recommend for Central Illinois, um, you did mention the Phoenix Center, you know, the Phoenix Center could be a, a great resource um, to see what they've done, how they're doing it. And um, I know uh, Dr. John Cooley very well. It's a great organization. Um, so that could be a good resource as well, uh, the Phoenix Center in Springfield. Um, I have a question from State Representative Lindsay LaPointe. Uh, what ideas does anyone have for how community leaders, uh, and in Representative LaPointe's case, the state rep, um, what ideas does anyone have for how community leaders can help to facilitate relationships between different generations of the LGBTQ community 
uh, in particular during this time of COVID when there's a huge need for support um, and open that up to anybody. That's a great question. Uh, it's, it's, it's a great question. You know, we're, we're all struggling, right, to, to uh, stay connected um, in, during this time. And, uh, you know, we obviously have Zoom and WebEx, but I, I, we're, we're dangerously close uh, for, for Zoom and WebEx fatigue, uh, I feel like. Uh, but, you know, when I think about that question, I think about something that I think uh, my office and other offices are doing, which are, are, are uh, essentially wellness checks to seniors. Uh, you know, we, we, we have phone banks going on where a couple days, couple nights a week uh, where we reach out to, to folks that are 60 plus, you know, just to touch base and say, hey, how you doing? Do you need anything, you know, food delivery, medication delivery, whatever it is, um, or other resources, because we know that they're gonna be more isolated than others, uh, you know, um, get, given the public health guidelines and so forth. Uh, and so actually, I, I think this is a question really, you know, um, I, Mike, not to throw it back at you, but, you know, if, if there's if there are if there's a way to identify, um, you know, LGBTQ uh, elders, uh, a list or a database, um, you know, starting a phone tree, phone, you know, phone banking where uh, they're able to connect and, and that I can't tell you. Um, how powerful that would be. Um, we, we hear from seniors all the time. We have a 10% response rate in our phone banking, uh, but even though that it's so low, when you get that call and you talk to somebody, they're so thankful to that. They're like, oh my God, you live down the street. That's so, thank you so much for, for reaching out. So that's just one idea is, is if there's a way to, um, if there's a way to, to, to have it, you know, look at the database of folks and, and ha have those conversations. But I also think, you know, things like this, a Zoom, you know, to talk about these issues um, on, on our own. I mean, if, if, if there are 10 or 12 Zooms that come out of this for each of our districts, at least having that conversation and, and you know, uh, raising awareness, um, you know, could be helpful. So that's just my thought on it. I, I echo everything Senator Villavon just said. It doesn't happen too often in, in my, <laughs> I appreciate that Representative Bob. Yeah. And um, Senator Representative, you you mentioned you know Equality Illinois, but I also want to lift up um, Pride Action Tank. Um, I want to lift up Sage, Center on Halstead, um, AIDS Foundation. You know, we talked about the Phoenix Center in Springfield. Um, and you, you'll see in the in the chat box, you'll see uh, different uh, organizational contacts being populated from Kim and Director Basta. Um, so, you know, uh, follow Pride Action Tank, um, follow SAGE and SAGE Connect, follow the Department of Aging, uh, the Center in Halstead, um, the Care Plan, um, Jackie Boyd. Uh, so many great resources exist. Um, and, you know, just following those connections. Um, and um, I, I had hoped I hadn't missed the date, but I had. But another, you know, we talk about stories. I want to also lift up um, um, Outspoken, which is an LGBTQ storytelling program um, that used to happen at Sidetrack when we could be in person, but um, is now digital. And Phyllis, who we heard from earlier, presented as part of the speakers on December 1st. So if you're interested in hearing stories, um, Outspoken provides great storytelling opportunities for members of the community uh, every month. So follow Outspoken on, on social media. So there's many great organizations doing, doing um, great, awesome work. And Kim, Kim is on it in the chat box. Um, um, and if I can also do a shout out sure. to Jeff, Jeff Barry. Jeff Barry, who is um, is at TPAN, they do. They also have the. I don't know, Jeff. Do you want to talk about the magazine that you guys do? Because it's such a great resource, and it's one that you know, for those of us who are not always, you know, online, this is an actual magazine that you can actually hold. Yeah, thanks, Paula. Um, so, Positively Aware is published by TPAN. I'm the editor of the magazine, and um, we are bi-monthly, but we also have a website at PositivelyWare.com. Uh, we cover a lot of aging-related uh, issues and um, topics, and we're going to be having some webinars coming up in the coming year, so there'll be more information about that. Um, I just also posted um, 
um, a, a comment in the chat re just relating to what you had to say er earlier, um, Senator Villabalum, uh, uh, regarding um, you know technology. Uh, many older L uh, adults, including LGBTQ older adults, don't uh, either know how to use the technology or um, have trouble with it or don't have bandwidth access or have you know bandwidth issues um, for accessing a, a, like Zoom, for instance, or other platforms that use you know higher bandwidth. Um, and so having um, one idea would be to have, and this came up on um, a, a meeting that we had yesterday, the reunion project had a national town hall where um, uh, long-term survivors came together and discussed the needs that they, um, Think their community uh, could could use that would help um, foster these kind of connections because connection is so important when, when we're isolated right now, um, and um, to have these internet uh, terminals or portals or um, and we have these at TPAN for some of the programs, but where people can come in and ac actually access um, like a, a meeting or use the internet or get help with how to use technology in particular, and so you know. Um, that's that would be really helpful, I think, and and go a long way in, in fostering and, and enabling communication. Um, but thank you, Polly. Yeah, PositivelyWare.com. Um, there's a lot of resources on HIV and aging there, and uh, so thank you. Great, thank you, thank you, Jeff. Um, uh, and also, just want to also highlight uh, two other organizations, uh, you know, doing great work as well: um, Howard Brown Health and AARP. Um, so there's so many great resources organizations um and i know we were all if i can speak for everybody which is dangerous but uh um i know we would all want to be helpful because we all have the common goal of advancing justice and equity for for lgbt older adults and older adults with hiv um and i appreciate all the questions i know we have a few more but for the for time purposes um i'm gonna uh, that would have been our last question so thank you to our panelists, um, thank you, Senator Villavallum, thank you, President Ma, uh, thank you, Director Basta, for your leadership. Um, and we just look forward to working with you uh, going forward. And now I want to turn it over, back over, to uh, my friend and champion, Kim Hunt, to wrap us up. So, Kim? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Uh, what a great panel and what a great program today. Um, and thank you so much. We've covered a lot of ground. Thank you to my colleagues and our storytellers and speakers, Jeff Berry, Jacqueline Boyd, Coleman Good, Roy Ferguson, Elizabeth Hyber, Phyllis Johnson, Danny Muriello, Aaron Tex, and to the wonderful Mike Ziri. Uh, a special thank you to the co-sponsors of SB 1319, State Senator Ron Villavallum and State Representative Teresa Ma and to the Illinois General Assembly for passing this groundbreaking and important legislation, as well as a thank you to Governor Pritzker for signing the legislation. And of course, thank you to Illinois Department of on Aging Director Paula Basta. Um, we look forward to continuing to work with you, Director Basta, on implementation of this law. And we continue to look forward to working uh, with Elizabeth and others on uh, really bringing forth and fleshing out this idea of a commission on LGBTQ aging. I also wanna thank the Outaging Committee for your ongoing dedication to this work. Uh, of course, I have to thank uh, AIDS Foundation Chicago's comms team for all their behind the scenes work that keep this going smoothly. Um, Thank you to our funders, AARP Illinois, the LGBTQ Community Fund of Chicago Community Trust and RRF Foundation for Aging. Uh, and last but not least, uh, thank you all for being here early in the morning for this very, very important conversation. And we hope that you enjoy the rest of the day. And to uh, all of the speakers today, please stay on for just a few minutes. We wanna take a group shot. We're reduced to doing this on Zoom uh, through our laptops, but uh, we would really like to capture this moment. So thank you everybody for being here and go out and continue to make it a great day. <laughs>